Hello, I'm Smitha Tharoor and welcome to Stories of Unconscious Bias, a podcast where I ask guests from around the world to share their story and to reflect on their life experiences with unconscious bias. I hope you enjoy listening. They were recorded globally under COVID-19 lockdown conditions. Welcome everybody to my podcast series on the unconscious bias. I'm thrilled to say that I have somebody very special to speak with right now, Giles Dooley. Giles Dooley is a documentary photographer and storyteller whose work focuses on long-term impact of conflict. Giles is also the CEO of the charity Legacy of War Foundation. I know that Giles will have very many stories to share with us on unconscious bias. Welcome and thank you so very much for joining us in this conversation, Giles. No, a pleasure. And, and thank you for having me. It's, um, it's something I'm looking forward to discussing. Brilliant. So unconscious bias, Giles, I mean, simple words, maybe. What, what do you understand by that? Uh, just those two simple words. You know, for, for me, it's just it's just the programming of, of, of um, growing up, really. I think it's, it's something that is, is instilled through the environment, through our families, uh, through our education, um, that we see the world in, in a certain way. And I think everybody has to accept that they, they have that, that everybody has a certain bias. And I think, you know, some people would say, oh, I have no bias or I have no, no, no outlook in that way. But I think that's not to be honest to yourself because it doesn't always have to be, you know, a negative thing or, or mean that you treat people in a bad way. But the simple fact is your upbringing um, will affect the way that you see other people in the world and the way you interact with them, both, both for good and for bad. Absolutely. And, and, and uh, you know, talking about upbringing is so crucial because so many of us, when, you know, we might have lived at home with our parents until, I don't know, 18, 20, and then we've left and we're 45, we're 55, and we think that everything we're doing is all learnt new because we're adults. And, of course, that's not the case. The programming, as you so correctly said, just those early years, those growing up years, and how uh, we were programmed to, to, to react and understand certain situations is entirely implicit. You're so right about that. And in fact, when, when you were saying that, I was thinking about one of my uh, previous interviews um, that I had done quite recently. And, uh, and this is a very dear friend of mine who lives in Sydney. She's a journalist living in Sydney. And, and she um, had poliomyelitis as a child. And she was saying to me, she's one of three sisters, but the way she was, and I'm consciously using your words, programmed uh, in terms of growing up within the family, was that she did everything her sisters did. She was treated no differently. Uh, she, you know, she would go to school and the teachers would say to her, oh, how can you play basketball or something? But as far as her parents were concerned, she did whatever her, friends, her sisters did. And therefore her outlook uh, and her, her, her attitude towards life would have been very different if she had been programmed differently. So when you're hearing stories of these kind of things, what comes to your mind, Giles? Yeah, actually, there's a, I mean, my mind is full of, of stories just hearing you talk and, and thinking about these things. I mean, my own, you know, personal thing, maybe maybe to start with something, um, you know, uh, I guess a, an eye-opener for me. I was injured in 2011 whilst working in Afghanistan. I stepped on a, a landmine and lost um, my legs and my arm. And, you know, I was 39 years old when that happened. And I went from being, you know, a white, uh, privileged, middle class English man um, who traveled the world, um, who had a very privileged position. And I was aware of that to somebody who was living with a very serious disability. I was in a wheelchair. Um, you know, I, I, I say I'm missing both my legs and my arm, um, a triple amputee. And. It was interesting because I suddenly saw how the world treated me differently. And maybe, you know, if somebody had grown up with the same uh, disability and was living with the same disability their whole life, if they were to describe how people acted around them, people might say, well, how do you know that? I could definitely tell you because I <laughs> was treated one way one day and very differently the next day. Um, and I saw how the world acted differently. And that was because of people's... Um, unconscious bias to my disability. Um, I can give you a couple of examples, but the 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 sort of the one that I remember first sort of hit me home that the people were never going to see me in the same way was 
it was uh, 2011 when I got injured, and that was the year that the Olympics came to London. And as somebody that competed quite successfully as a, as a, as a kid um, in athletics and 100 meters, I was very excited about watching all the events at the Olympics. And I remember then one of the nurses uh, doing her rounds one day, and we were chatting about getting a TV, and she said, oh, you want to watch the Paralympics? And it just really struck me, it really hit home and actually really upset me because I suddenly realized that, that nothing had changed in my mind. I was exactly the same person that I had been the day before I got injured to who I was the day after I got injured. But now the world was going to see me and treat me in a completely different way, as if I was a different person. And the fact that, in my mind, I wanted to watch the Olympics, but somebody else's assumption, somebody else's unconscious bias was that surely, as he is you know, missing limbs, he would want to watch the Paralympics. And, you know, that really, to me, was a great example of, of what we're talking about, that, that people had made assumptions based on uh, my physical appearance. And so it was, say, it was a very difficult thing to deal with, but also very illuminating and made me question a lot of my own um, unconscious bias and the way that maybe I treated people or spoke to people or interacted with people, and most specifically the way I told people stories was because of my own unconscious bias, even though I may have thought I didn't have one. Hmm. Uh, it's, it's, um, I mean, I'm not even quite sure how to react to that story that you share, shared, Giles, because I, I'm thinking of the emotions that you'd have had lying on that hospital bed uh, and the nurse saying what she said to you or he said to you, I don't know the gender of the nurse. But it's so interesting that all of us, um, anywhere in whatever situation, jump to conclusions. That nurse was probably thinking that they were being very kind in suggesting you wanted to watch the Paralympics. But of course, you never saw yourself any different. But you said it also made you began to think about how your storytelling and your communication to others uh, uh, would have been different perhaps prior to age 39, you know, zero to 38. Um, many of those years, you were, you were very much a, a documentary a photographer, you were still traveling, you were still going to places, you had a busy life. So what kind of stories can you share? That's the kind of the before and after, perhaps, uh, when you had the accident and what you learned from that as well. Yeah, I mean, I would say one thing, just getting back to your, your, your last things you were saying, is that actually often the, the hardest things, the most upsetting things, are the things that are said in kindness. Um, you know, when somebody says something hateful, you know, somebody, again, living with disability, there is you know, disability, hate crimes, you maybe get somebody shout something at you in the street. It's very easy to deflect those things as somebody else's anger and somebody else's problem issue. Um, when somebody says something in kindness, in supportive way, um, such as about the Paralympics, those are the things that really dig home and hurt because you realize that that is how people perceive you and, and see you. Um, I have a, <laughs> it's a kind of semi-joke um, Instagram called the one Arm Chef, which is my, my cooking. Um, and I set that up because I've always loved cooking and I love food. And when I, I lost my arm, I just had to adapt. I, I said I would never have anything in my kitchen adapted, that I would adapt to things. So I have a normal kitchen and I cook just as well as I did before. But again, I would go out and have a meal. Even I remember once on a, on a date and my food came out from, from the restaurant and it had all been cut up into small pieces. And it really upset me because, again, it was somebody probably trying to be very kind and helpful and could see that I had one arm. Um, and so they cut my food up for me. But I had not requested that. So what mm. they had done is sort of infantize me. They had made me into a child, um, somebody that was not capable. And so, as I say, I, I set up this Instagram um, to show all the cooking that I do one handed. And now if that kind of thing happens, I show them the picture of some of the dishes that I've prepared with one hand and say, I bet you couldn't do that with two hands. But exactly. this, this again is something out of, out of a kindness that people would see and think I should help this person because he has one hand, but would never think to ask or wait to be, you know, I would say one thing I, I never lost was the ability to ask for help. So yeah, unconscious bias is something we, we have around us all the time. And of course it's affected my work. You know, I've always gone, to try and tell stories of people affected by conflict um, with the basic premise that I wanted to do something to stop conflict, that I'm disgusted by war. Um, I'm very aware 
that is somebody coming from the UK, that many of the conflicts around the world have been caused directly or indirectly by our history. And so I wanted to do something about that. But when you are then for the first time going to Afghanistan or going to Iraq or going to DR Congo and you're meeting somebody there and trying to work with them to tell their story, of course, you carry with you that unconscious bias. And certainly when it came to people living with disabilities, I think before my injury, I probably saw their stories in a very different way to afterwards. And the, the biggest thing I would say is that from my own experience, I realized that with legs or no legs inside my head, everything was just the same. Um, but people saw me differently. And I realized that I probably done that as a photographer, that I saw people's injuries first before I saw them and their story. So now, you know, my advice always to young photographers now is don't see the injury, see the person and document that. And by documenting their story, the, the, the real story of, of living with disability will come out. So it's definitely affected the way that I work. Um, and it's been interesting in a weird way. There's also sort of been a flip side to that where the people that I now document obviously see my injuries and they can sometimes have their own um, unconscious bias towards uh, my experience and how that's affected me. Um, but one thing I would say is I have learned a lot in my work to be a, a non-verbal communicator and I'm dyslexic. I always struggled with, with language. I was held back a year at school. I was told I was stupid. Um, and I find that it's in my language, and maybe this is the same for other people, but it's in my language that unconscious bias comes across the most. And maybe that's because when I speak and think of words, I think of learning, I think of things I've read, things I've heard, um, all those things that we said earlier sort of program our bias. And when I lose those things, I feel I lose some of that um, unconscious bias that is, is part of my, my upbringing and my DNA. So what do I mean by that? Well, food. I was about to say, yes, yeah. yeah. So a practical illustration of that is, is food. Um, you know, I, I'm often around uh, communities where we don't speak the same language. I will have a translator when I'm actually doing interviews, but a lot of the time I choose not to have a translator. And I'm very happy to be around people and not uh, speak with them. And uh, a good example of this is a restaurant in Milan. And uh, many years ago, I traveled to Milan to do a story and I arrived quite late at night. I was really hungry. My hotel wasn't doing any food. So I popped out, tried to find somewhere to eat. And I found a little bar, went in there, tried to sort of signal that I wanted food. And they, they, they shook their heads and said, no, they're serving. So I decided, I, well, I wasn't going to find anywhere else to eat. I'll just have a couple of drinks and then go back to my hotel. Um, as Often is the case, a couple of drinks turned into a few more and it became quite a fun, uh, raucous night. The owner was playing the piano. There were shots of Sambuca going around and it was a really great atmosphere. Um, and although I was kind of sat on my table on my own, I felt part of this, this, this group of people enjoying the evening. Um, after a few too many drinks on my way to the toilet, I saw the kitchen was open. And so I decided to go in and start cooking. Um, it was about four o'clock in the morning and I, and I walked in there and started cooking. And the owner uh, discovered me and started shouting at me. Um, and then tasted like any good Italian. He couldn't resist tasting what I was cooking um, and actually found it was really good. And so in the end, I ended up cooking for, for all the people that sat in the restaurant that night. So every time I'm in Milan, I would pop back to that same place. I walk in there and I always get this great Milanese food. And the owner comes over and brings me a drink. And about a year ago, I went there for the first time with somebody else. I'd always just gone there on my own. And I'd been in Milan doing a talk and, and several people who, were with me at the event came with me and we walked into the restaurant and the owner comes out and my friend filmed it and it's one of the most beautiful moments you could see of this guy coming up and he puts both hands on my cheeks and he kisses me on the forehead and he's crying and I'm almost in tears and we're just looking at each other and we're smiling and it's really almost like more like the kind of return of the prodigal son it's it's a really really tender moment of, of two people that haven't seen each other for a while anyway we sit down we start eating and then my friend says wait a minute he goes, the, the owner doesn't speak any English. And I went, oh, I hadn't thought about that. And they go, and you don't speak any Italian? And I go, well, no. And they were like, how have you two spoken? How have you two become such good friends? And honestly, at that point, I hadn't even thought about it. It's just that we'd always communicated by food, by smiling, by chatting. And that's what I mean by being a non-verbal communicator. That is where I actually feel most comfortable. That is so beautiful. 
Yeah, but it's it's something that I uh, feel really, really comfortable being around people. And as I hadn't even really realized that we had built this relationship without ever having spoken. And how does that translate into my work? Um, I always try and eat uh, and share a meal, uh, maybe cook with the, the people whose portraits I'm doing. Um, I remember being in, in Mosul and Mosul was, was, was hell on earth a few years ago. Um, and I was there um, near, near the end of the fighting and I'd gone to visit a family which had been devastated by, by the, uh, the war between ISIS and the Iraqi um, government. And the, the mother had been killed, the father had been killed, the grandfather had been killed, and the only remaining members of the family were his grandmother and the three children. And the house was virtually burnt down, there were bullet holes everywhere. It was, it was really like a, a terrible, terrible place. And when I first turned up, the grandmother had been screaming her story at me. And I didn't really know how to deal with it, and, and I'd been trying to tell her to, to, to not tell me. She didn't need to tell me all these horrific things I'd just come to visit. And eventually through the translator, I said, can you explain to her that actually I've just come here to cook with her? And you know, when he first said this, you could see her kind of a bit confused. It's, it's one armed guy and traveled halfway around the world to a war zone just to cook with her. And, and she was kind of like, well, I don't quite understand that. And so she carried on um, and, and she was, was screaming and, and again said, no, please tell her that my grandmother is no longer with us. But she had taught me to cook. And because my grandmother is no longer around, I need a new grandmother to teach me. So he, he told her the story and, and then she smiled for the first time and, and sort of nodded her head and said, fine. So I said, OK, I'll come back tomorrow. And the next day I returned and I brought a, a chicken, a frozen chicken and some rice. Um, and it turned out this grandmother was actually the worst cook in the world. I mean, she was terrible. She, <laughs> we, we spent the first hour trying to, um, to break this chicken. We were using a hammer and chisel to smash it to even get it in a pot. Um, it was chaos. But we spent the day cooking. And the grandchildren were there laughing and, and joining in. And we didn't really talk, but we cooked. And, and then we sat down and, and we shared a meal at the end of that day. And then we shared stories. And we, we, we learned the story of what had happened to that family during the war. And, and she learned some of my story. And that's what I mean about how, for me at least, taking away language sometimes helps with getting rid of my own unconscious bias. When she was stood That's there really as, as an powerful. Well, I think, you know, as an Iraqi woman, a grandmother, who stood there uh, screaming at me the story of what had happened when I first met her, I didn't know how to react to that. You know, culturally, my life is completely different to hers. And my unconscious bias of who she is meant that, that communication would be very um, unconnected. But through food, through sharing a meal, through cooking a chicken, through those things, that was somehow something where we could share on a neutral plane, on a neutral ground. That, that was something that brought us together, that both of us, because she obviously also had her unconscious bias about a white journalist in her house. And I would like to think that sitting down and sharing that meal together meant that we found that common ground and through that we're able to understand each other in a way that wasn't quite through the same spectrum of that unconscious bias. This is, I mean, I, I, if we're listening to you, if you could have seen my face right now, I was firstly trying very hard not to laugh too loudly so that I don't <laughs> disturb your, disturb the recording. But I was laughing, then I was moved. I mean, there were so many different emotions on my face when I was listening to the story because it's funny, yet it is so powerful and so very moving. Both the Italian story as well as uh, the Iraqi story uh, because it is, it's the bigger point that you've made, which I'm just trying to, to articulate again for my own sake, really, to understand, which is essentially that with unconscious biases, what we tend to do is we listen to what we want to hear. So you say something and I hear whatever I want to hear. It's like confirmation bias. But if you don't understand what they're saying, then what can you hear? You can only hear what you see, which is the, the bad cutting of, of a chicken with somebody who doesn't know how to cook, perhaps, um, or being shouted out by this Italian owner while you're happily, merrily using his <laughs> kitchen. I mean, they're both, they're both completely different stories, but they're not. And that is the power of what those two stories have given me. The fact that so many of us, because all of us communicate by, by words, verbally, or even by written word, you know, you read something and you read it the way you want to. How many people will talk about sending emails and then being misunderstood 
by the way it's written and they don't realize how the other person is reading it because of their unconscious biases. And there you are with no words. I mean, words are there, but you don't understand each other because it's a foreign language to you and yours to them. And yet you get to a, to a commonality and an understanding and you actually get a story. You get each other's stories, which, which is um, moving, moving uh, more than I can explain to you. Um, but uh, other than this idea of cooking and, 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 and communicating without words, what other experiences, because you've had the, the, the privilege of traveling to so many different countries, um, what other stories can you share perhaps about your unconscious biases that you can now reflect on, which are now obviously something that you've addressed, perhaps when you went to another country, you talked about being this white privileged male um, arriving somewhere and perhaps seeing the world slightly differently based on your upbringing. I mean, what does that mean? What does that look like? I think, you know, it's, it's a very, it's difficult maybe to think of the things, um, uh, exact examples where I've got it wrong because it, it, by its very definitions, the unconscious nature of, of the bias means you don't always see the fact you've been seeing things wrong. But what I, I have discovered is, is to understand people's stories is I needed to find a common ground where both of us could lose some of that bias. And so, you know, for example, take a story of doing, um, I remember years ago doing a story on very, very early on, probably one of the first or second stories I did um, in Angola. And I, this is maybe 15 years ago, and I was setting out to be a, a serious documentary photographer up to that point. I've been doing portraits and other kind of work, more commercial work. And this is where I wanted to be the serious photographer. And I'd gone there, and it was one particular story in Angola. The Civil War just ended, and we were in the areas that used to be uh, the rebel areas. And I'd been told by a, a priest about an abandoned school um, and, and church complex. It had been a, a vast place that had been abandoned that was now um, inhabited or, or people living there were widows of the war, the widows of the rebel soldiers who were pretty much in hiding there. They were worried about what the government forces might do now that the war was over. Um, and they were living in, in some poverty. He said, but, you know, because I think you'd love it as a photographer. It's very visual, very powerful. So we should go there. So I went there and I remember the first time I walked into this, this, the main building, um, everybody just ran away. All the women ran away. They didn't know who I was. Um, they obviously just saw this, this white man turning up and they were scared and they were worried and they just disappeared. So I decided the only way I could do the story was just to keep going back each day and, and, and being there. And I would return each day and I would sit there and little by little, they, they sort of, got used to me being there and people would start going about their normal life and I would start to take photographs. I didn't have a translator and I couldn't communicate um, with any of anybody there, but, but obviously they, they understood what I was doing. I was a photographer and I was documenting what was there. As I said, this was right at the beginning and I was there thinking I'm this very serious photographer and this is a very serious story. And these women have suffered terribly. I know a lot of them had suffered sexual violence. They'd lost partners to the war. They'd lost children. And I knew in my mind that these people had these intense lives and I should document it in that way. And so I have these photographs um, from that set, from that, that project, and they're beautiful photographs. They're, they're very stark black and white images and somebody, probably some of the most beautiful photographs I've ever done because this building was, was stained with the smoke from the fires. There was smoke wafting around in these images. The women were, were tall and elegant and, and it's just very, very classic documentary photography. But when I look at those photographs now, I realize that I was seeing their stories through my unconscious bias. And that unconscious bias meant that I saw them in this very reverential way and that everything was serious and I had to reflect that seriousness. And what I remember is this incident that happened and I didn't photograph it. And I always look back and regret that I didn't. And what had actually happened is as I say, the, the women had got very used to me being there. And then I then started, it started to switch the other way where I became a kind of novelty. And uh, the people would sort of, uh, the women would come up behind me. And one of the games they had, bearing in mind some of these women were in their sort of 70s and 80s, they would sneak up behind me and try and pinch my backside. And it sort of become a joke that when I was there about to take a photograph, one of them would pinch me and all the women would burst into laughter. So there's this beautiful photograph of all these women stood in the, in the shade with the light beaming through these windows, the smoke everywhere. 
And just as I took this photograph, a woman pinched me on the ass and everybody burst into laughter. And I have the very serious photograph of them all looking serious, but I never took the photograph of them all laughing. Because in my head, that didn't reflect their story. Because in my head, that unconscious bias of a, of a guy brought up in the UK and seeing documentary photographs from, from developing countries and from war zones, I thought they had to look a certain way. And if I portrayed these women laughing, somehow that wouldn't be the right thing to do. Now, of course, I would photograph them laughing. That would be the story because I realized that's who they were. But when I started, I was seeing their stories through my biased eyes of how I thought they should be portrayed. And it was not honest to their story. That is so beautiful. And I'm, <laughs> I'm visualizing this lady coming and pinching your bottle. <laughs> yes. Just as, you, as you click the shutter. You know, and the funny thing <laughs> is, it's almost... <laughs> I always remember it in my head thinking that this is not how they should be acting. Even though I'd never been to anywhere like that. In my head, I knew how they should act because I'd no, seen these. You decided, exactly. Yes, because I'd seen the photographs is, of Don is... McCullen, of, of yeah. Salgado, and all these very stark and powerful black and white images. And I'm like, that's what these stories that's are. That's what I've got. Serious. I am an important man taking exactly. important photographs. Exactly. And, there and I you can't have, have a picture of a bunch of women people. laughing. <laughs> oh, that's beautiful. I mean, it's just really, really wonderful. I, especially the pinched bottom. Yes. <laughs> oh, it's brilliant. Brilliant. But so, Giles, I mean, you've had so many different experiences um, and, and you must have learned so many different things from it. And, and of course, you, you're very hyper aware of conscious bias and unconscious bias. And of course, as I think all of us, as we get older, um, with or without the incredible experiences you have had, will hopefully reflect and think and, and see what we can do differently. So, I mean, what kind, what kind of advice can you give us listeners, give me? I mean, I, I, I am not a war photographer. I am not a photographer. I've never been to the places you have been to uh, uh, or experienced what you have experienced. But yet I know that I will have unconscious biases and then I will look at the world and have to try and reflect and do things differently. So how does one do that? I mean, it's not an easy thing to do. No, I mean, I think the first thing um, is, is, is the most essential, and this works both as for journalists, but also for photographers, for storytellers, but also for all of us in everyday life. And that is to listen. And, and when I say listen, I mean really listen to somebody. And again, as a photographer, you know, I, I would go on assignments and go on projects in exactly the same way I just described, where I would go with an idea of what I was going to produce. I would go there thinking, I'm going to this country, this story, because I know what's happening and I need to document that and tell everybody else. And so that was me traveling with my unconscious bias and going there with an opinion. And it's the same when we meet people. People, if somebody meets me, they are like, I'm going to meet this person. He has no legs, one arm. They're making a, a, a preconception of me. We all do it. So the first thing we have to do is to actually really listen to somebody and not listen to them hearing what we want to hear. As you said earlier, it's very easy mm. to listen to somebody, but hear what you think you're hearing. And deep listening, really listening, is, is a skill. And it takes a time. And it's something that we all have to keep working on. And I'm still working on and learning about. But actually giving somebody the time to tell their story, to share things about their life, and really taking it in and listening to it and listening to it as the truth and as their truth. Um, and as I say, it, it's something that takes, that takes practice that we have to keep doing and I'm still working on. But I think that's the first thing is listen to somebody because that will challenge your own you know, perceptions of, of, of that person's experience. And then the other thing is then to find that common ground, to find somewhere where you can communicate where there is no bias and you can both be yourselves. Because as I say, we have to remember that the unconscious bias works both ways. It's not just one thing of, you know, the very obvious bias of, you know, being a, a, a white male Westerner traveling to various countries that I have a bias about those people's stories, which we've discussed and obviously I do. Likewise, people have a bias about me being there and the person that they're meeting. 
So how do you find a common ground where that can go? And that's why I think, you know, for me at least, I've discovered that through food or through other ways of doing it. You know, when I was earlier, when I was telling the story about the Iraqi grandmother, you know, how many people listening to that story had conjured up an image of how she looked? And I'm sure most of us would have conjured up an image of what that woman looked like that I met. And maybe that is how she looked. Maybe it isn't. It just, it's not for me to tell you at this moment. But that's obviously part of our bias that's creating that, that imagery when I tell you an evocative story about an Iraqi woman in Mosul. Now, what you probably didn't expect was her laughing and trying to break a chicken and smashing it with a hammer to try and get it in a pot. Because that sort of starts challenging that image that most of us probably had of that Iraqi woman. And so that's what I'm always trying to do is to find this area, this common ground, which is through which is through jokes and storytelling and also through sharing something like food, something that we all have our own experience of, something that we can all relate to and something that maybe connects us in a way that goes beyond that unconscious bias. I'm nodding away uh, uh, in, in a complete agreement with you. Absolutely. Listen, listen with big fat ears. Listen to what their honesty, their truth, because it's nothing to do with us and really listen. And then having that common ground. And of course, I was visualizing the Iraqi woman. I was visualizing the, the, the people pinching mm. your bottom. Mm -hmm. I was visualizing the Milanese owner of the restaurant. Mm -hmm. they, they were all people in my head. And I, yeah. I put features and heights and weight and everything to them. Um, who knows whether I'm right or wrong, and it doesn't matter. No, but it doesn't about... matter, and that's natural that we do that. But what we also have to do is just find ways yeah. to to break through that and to find something exactly. that, that go, takes us to the next level of understanding yes. and, and empathy with someone. Yes, because then visualizing the Iraqi woman, the last thing you would expect is for you to follow up and saying that she's a lousy cook and is beating it with a hammer. You know, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't compute. You just assume yes. her to be an amazing cook, naturally. Naturally, yep. is what most of us would be saying. So, so that's exactly the contradictions. And to not expect to be surprised, because that's the world is full of surprises, and not to make stereotypical expectations in any situation. Now, this has been wonderful. In equal, equal ways, laugh out loud, move to tears, um, extremely powerful, interesting, uh, evocative stories that you have shared with us. Giles, this has been brilliant. Giles, Julie, thank you so very much for your sharing your stories and sharing your wisdom on how we can handle our unconscious bias. It's been an absolute joy. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Stories of Unconscious Bias with me, Smitha Tharoor. Stay tuned for the next interview in a week's time. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter for updates on my episodes at Smitha Tharoor.